Cade Mila Falcha, welcome. I'm Dr. Sinead McCool, and this is my absolute privilege to ask you to uh, join us tonight for this very special event, marking of the centenary of what became known as the Treaty Debates, when elected representatives, the Tokta Dali of the Second Stol Aaron, took their place in this historic building, now the National Concert Hall, which was then a university building. The TDs of the Second Dáil Éireann were here debating the acceptance of the provisions of the Articles of Agreement between Great Britain and Ireland. It was here that they, in both public and private session, during the month of December of 1921. The debates of that, not that time are our fo centenary focus, these very days 100 years ago. So if you find your mind rushing ahead to what happened next, we ask you to think of the TDs tonight anew, to think about the moments in December 1921, not to move into 22. As individuals with lives that, li that were lived to this point, their own personal stories of the campaign of independence, of war, of tragedy, of loss. They were recorded walking into this building by footage and by photographers. There are images of men guarding internal stairs. I walked those very stairs this evening. Today, we join with artists who are going to transport you back in time. In preparation for these event, these artists, songwriters, folk singers, balladeers, musicians, read widely. They will give us their unique responses. They selected their individuals. And as I endeavor to be their guide to new texts, to new books, to new scholarship, bring them to new people to speak to, to take on the person that they were going to embody in their songs. You will hear that they drew on their own interests, their own places, their own kinship, their education. And yet they did, they read those debates. So was that their task was to embody a person who was part of these historic events. And so with this decade of centenary, their writing centered on original source material, the voices of the people themselves. And where possible, they met with descendants. They discussed with the, the descendants their knowledge of past generations, how they brought those memories from generation to generation, and how those descendants had analysis of their own people, those people who inadvertently became history makers. We know how the songs of the commemoration of 1798 became so important to the next generation. So too we work in Ireland's long tradition of song written of those events of Irish history. These artists selected well-known and some less well-known people from a list of over 100. They took events and moments and made them their own. As you will see, they become embedded in their songs under their own creative control. There is a multiplicity of stories, and these sto songs have layers. They will bring us to places that are beyond the reach of those who write fact, and often those who write fiction. I want to conclude with a reflection made by Donna McDonough, the orphaned son of Thomas McDonough and Muriel Gifford. He made it in the 1950s, writing in the Irish press. He recalled his childhood when he heard a ballad about his aunt, when he heard the lines that were as follows. I loved Joe Plunkett and he loved me. He gave his, his life to set Ireland free. When the child became a man and in 1955, when he was writing an obituary of his aunt, Grace Gifford Plunkett, I want to look at the lines that, that he concluded, what he wrote about his aunt in this obituary. And I quote, what Ireland will remember longest in the scene at Kilmainham prison, when she married by the light of two guttering candles, the young man who was to be executed in a few hours, now she is dead. But as long as Ireland has a history, she will be remembered. And with these words, I want to hand over to our history makers of tonight. Thank you very much indeed.
it's a privilege to be here as part of this evening's collective songs, treaty songs. Uh, this first song tonight, I first heard it in 1966 in London, and uh, I got a small red book which was published by the London Workers' Cooperative. I learned the song from it, and it's been in my head ever since, all across the years. And it was only this year I discovered that the song was written by Patrick Galvin, the poet, songwriter, and playwright of Cork, who lived from 1923 to 2011. He wrote a lot of wonderful songs, wonderful poetry, songs for a raggy boy, and I sing the song now and dedicate it to the memory of Patrick Galvin. I went to see David, to London to see David. I went to see David, and what did he do? He gave me a free stare, a nice little free stare, tied on to the empire with red, white, and blue. Well, I brought it to Dublin to show to Dal Aaron. I brought it to Dublin, and what did they do? They asked me what kind of a thing was a free state tied on to the empire with red, white, and blue. Three quarters of Ireland, a nation, I told them, tied on to the empire like gum to a shoe. And not we must swear to King George and Queen Mary, and not we must swear to our son in law new. Oh, well, I teach them their Irish, and I paint their letter boxes all over in green, and what more can I do? But they tell me that they want an Irish Republic, a Republic without any red, white, or blue. Oh, I went to see David, to London to see David. I went to see David, and what did he do? He gave me a free stare, a nice little free stare, tied on to the empire with red, white, and blue. From Patrick Galvin.
Hello, we're the Darkling Air. Um, thanks to the National Concert Hall for having us here tonight. We're going to play a song called In Conscience. That's by Robert Byrne.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you please welcome on stage the wonderful Duke Special with May Kay and the Crash Ensemble. Good evening. Um, it's such an honor to be part of um, the proceedings tonight. Um, when I was asked to, to choose a character from the, uh, a person from the um, uh, treaty negotiations, I was drawn to a man who um, seemed full of contradictions and complexity. And uh, living in Belfast, that somehow resonated with me for some reason. <laughs> um, he was born in England and had careers in the English civil service, fought in the Boer War and the First World War, and at one time was a, a great believer in the, in the, in the empire, um, but at the time of the negotiations was now advocating uh, a united uh, Republic of Ireland uh, completely free from Britain. And I, I thought that was really intriguing as, as to how he'd come to that point. Um, he was... Um, a sailor, an avid sailor, he was a writer, uh, he was meticulous in detail, and he was unbending and uncompromising. Um, his role in the, in the negotiations was to uh, record, to write down all the, everything that happened, and he was also uh, sending um, information back to De Valera. Uh, but I didn't write about any of that, actually. Um, despite uh, uh, Dr. Sinead's instructions, I did dip into 1922 and uh, almost a year later um, he was arrested and found guilty of uh, legal possession of a weapon and the night before he was due to be executed his 16 year old son had five minutes to visit him and during that, time, that very short visit uh, he instructed his son made him promise uh, that he would go around and shake the hand of every person that signed his, his death warrant and I couldn't shake that uh, it stayed with me um, and his reason for doing that was to, uh, in some way, heal the scars of the Civil War. And I had the opportunity uh, to talk to his great-grandson, also called Erskine Childers, who the song is about. And um, we spoke about the preservation of that name that was handed on and handed on and handed on. And also the great weight uh, of carrying that name. So this song is from the perspective of his son um, shortly after that visit um, to, the, to the Beggar's Bush Barracks in Dublin. And this is Erskine Childers. the harbor you were born for the sea with a thirst for adventure Croxhaven Gallipoli sailing out to the edges whatever the storm chasing your destiny was your center, my mother, beloved of all. I was your admiral, your echo, your messenger, all the anguish of leaving and happiness stained.
side of the Englishman An alien to the ones you called home Stretch till you broke between two countries see you, your poetic blood of the brave. But the empire had blind eyes and the revolution was a shield. I wish to God you'd stayed in London with the lessons they learned at the song. Poetry's no sister to violence. And the pen is no friend of the ball. You were full of sea fever, but your honor was true. I'll keep my promises to you. I will carry your My name is Jonathan, and I just thought I'd take a moment to introduce my piece to you this evening. Um, my work is purely instrumental, and so there's no singer involved, and so no lyrics around which to weave a narrative. Um, it was a real privilege to be invited to take part this evening, but I realized very early on that I had to abandon the idea, really, of focusing on one individual. Um, how would you, the audience, for instance, know that the violin represented some personality trait, and, or what would that even sound like musically? And so I decided I had to step back a little bit and actually take a look at the wider picture. And so the individuals that came together to debate the treaties, they came from all over the country and from all walks of life. And each one of those people had an idea of what our country should be what our country could be. And so my piece begins with a musical idea. 
and that musical idea is debated. So it's built upon and it's uh, elongated and it's investigated and it's compressed. And then that idea starts to become fragmented and it starts to weave its way around new material. And when we get to the end of the piece, that idea is gone and we're left with something else and something different. So the title of my piece is, This is Our Home, We Live Here. And to perform it this evening, we have the wonderful Crash Ensemble. And I hope you enjoy.
beautiful. Um, I'm Karen Casey, and um, I'm going to uh, sing uh, a few songs about this amazing woman. I brought my book out. Kathleen Clark, there she blows. Um, an incredible uh, woman, I've really enjoyed uh, learning all about her. Um, she uh, was a piano player and uh, was a daily from Limerick and her family uh, wanted her to go into their family business and be a baker. But she insisted on uh, becoming um, a seamstress and running her own business and then she fell in love with Tom Clark, um, the uh, first president of the Irish Republic. Yep, I believe that's why we're here. And um, she married him, she sailed across uh, to America, she kind of defied her family, and she was very much in love with him. I think that really comes across in the memoir. And uh, then they came back uh, from America, specifically to start um, a rising. And so I was very taken you know, with her love uh, for Tom and the amount that she herself sacrificed. Uh, so I have the first, I wrote two songs, and uh, the first one is a love song from Kathleen to Tom, and then he answers her. And then the second song is a bit more defiant about her life, trying to keep his memory alive, and indeed the uh, ideals of uh, the, the Republic. And um, she was uh, extraordinary. She tried to stay in public life, even though... And many of the men um, in what today would be Fine Gael and Fine Fáil tried to get rid of her and push her to the side, but she insisted on staying and being in public life, and she was the first mayor of uh, Dublin. So I could, it's very hard now to get all that into the two songs. <laughs> we could be here for the, for the night. Um, I, I've loads more to tell you, but I probably should sing the songs. But I do want to thank a couple of uh, people. I want to thank Sinead McCool, who I think is just an extraordinary woman. And <laughs> and in a way, her books, The Easter Widows and No Ordinary Women, uh, kind of led me on a pathway to all of these women that we don't know um, a lot about. Well, I certainly didn't. And it's brilliant that we're honoring them now. And uh, also to Helen Lytton, who is uh, Kathleen Clark's uh, grandniece and who I believe um, is in the house tonight. If Helen would like to stand up and say thank you. So thanks to Helen for writing, uh, editing Kathleen's memoir. It should be taught in all the school books, all the, school, all the schools. And uh, finally, I want to thank my husband, Niall Vallely, because uh, I stole his beautiful tune, um, Sula Hivna, for the first song. Um, when myself and Niall were falling in love, uh, we were in America. And so that re reminded me of Kathleen and Tom. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Thank you. 
keeper of the flame I take a silver sonnet from the corner of my heart place it on the sky shimmering and shining Softly to the moon everywhere. I'd build a walk with round the moon. I'd cross the starry ground, falling at your feet to be with you somehow. I'd we say. Tonight I have come in from the dark With the earth in my hair I feel freedom, not despair And I've come in from my grave To speak of the brave I've come in from my grave To speak From the town of Limerick, I do hail against the crown I did rail. My family I did fight when I sailed that ocean wide to where. But the crown shone my husband down like dead. And the very next day they killed my brother Ned. My curse attend the men who have turned their backs on me. Those who pray. I will rise. I will rise.
of the kingdom of Ireland to the bishops and the crown. Kevin O'Higgins says that women's heels are drumming too loud. There are those who dismiss womankind, say that we are forever losing our minds, that we are embittered. Kesht na tiangan, the soul of Ireland. Moroa, morto era. Moroa, morto era. Under this treaty, we can revive our own language. In less than a dozen years For the language is the soul of our nation We can have control of education In less than two generations We can have our language back Our own Irish language again So all for unwilling Barlium mere fui glory is a tiang of finicky. No era sir is gone a tiang of finicky. So all for unwilling. Moroa marato era. It's a chachty a gara a chela. It's ni fada gamed a maro chela. A hien chorla is a loch na dala. Ba valium gailing a lower tonsa. Ach nil moron gailing sa doil sha. So of all for unwilling The language is the soul of the nation We can have control of education In less than two generations We can have our language back Our own Irish language again So of all for unwilling 
Tear gun tongue, tear gun on him. Tear gun tongue, tear gun on him. Gromagwev, Moira McSweeney, the ballad of the treaty debate. In the heart of Dublin city, where the ancient spirits sing, down around the concert hall, the ghost voices ring. December 1921, under a war weary, Weak winter sun. The second oil is meeting to decide our nation's fate. The guns have fallen silent for the treaty debate. My name, it is Moira McSweeney, and I beg you, throw out that treaty. Throw out that treaty, do not commit the one unforgivable crime. If my country should be so false to itself as to adopt that so-called treaty, I have told Michael Collins I will be the first rebel in their so-called free state. My name Moira McSweeney and I beg you throw out that treaty throw out that treaty do not commit the one unforgivable crime if Michael Collins went to hell in the morning would you follow him there would you follow him Yes, no, yes. My name, it is Moira McSweeney. And I beg you, throw out that treaty. Throw out that treaty. Do not commit the one unforgivable crime. What I went through. For 74 days in Brixton prison Gives me the right to speak For the honor of my nation My name, it is Moira McSweeney And I beg you Throw out that treaty, throw out that treaty, do not commit the one unforgivable crime. You will have your union, Jack, your God save the king. We will all be British citizens. I fear for the honor of my country. My name, it is Moira McSweeney And I beg you, throw out that treaty Throw out that treaty, do not commit The one unforgivable crime <laughs>
Hi. Hi, it's me. I'm sure you've all been worried I wasn't going to show up. Um, I'm doing a song about Eamon de Valera. And uh, it was a challenging brief, but a very worthwhile one. Um, I obviously did not know loads about him. I knew enough and probably don't agree with him <laughs> on most things. So I tried to get into the psychology of the man and tried to view him as a person in his time, which was uh, hard to do, but definitely pretty interesting. And I hope you find it interesting too. Will we do it? What do you think? Obviously sing along. George in New York City in a home for abandoned babies. Your mother's family called you Eddie. How many people were you in your life? And how hard did you have to try? man, the Irish American, proves even an outsider can cause her, 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 her. join the Irish volunteer. Found yourself a new career. Did you have hope and did you have fear? How many people were you in your life? And how hard did you have to try? The life of a ruthless man, the Irish American. No comely maidens, just women trapped in laundries and kitchens, the island that you dreamed of, and the womb that you delivered onto the church straight from the
Hello, everybody. I hope you're enjoying yourselves. Um, I'm Adrian Crowley. I thought I'd explain a little bit about the song that I wrote for you tonight and also talk about this woman standing on my left and on my right. I went into the Ivy Gardens earlier on, made some notes, just so I might talk about a few things. Um, so, it was a spring day in 1919. A young woman knocked on the door of number six Harcourt Street with a typewriter under one arm and a letter from her dad. Um, she had responded to a request to uh, sit for an interview as, as typist for a nascent underground paper. Um, and in the room to assess her dexterity was Arthur Griffith, Desmond Fitzgerald, and Robert Brennan. So she sat down, placed a wax stencil into the typewriter, and started typing furiously while well, she got the job. And not only that, she went on to become Arthur's private secretary. And, well, that day she sat down and typed was the day the first edition of the Bulletin was born. And she typed every single edition since. It came out five times a week. And as you can, as you know, it was, they had to keep packing up and rushing off with a duplicator, a rotary duplicator, this portable printing machine, um, because of raids and, you know, she actually had that printing machine in her flat in Drumcondra for a while, working throughout the night. Anyway, this song is from her perspective, um, just after the truce and on the eve of the treaty negotiations where she was present at. And she's looking back at the 20 months. Oh, I, I should mention a few references. She's looking back over the 20 months of um, strife, pursuit, danger, friendship. And Arthur saw that she was so devoted to the paper. She said, he said to her, it's like you're it's Godmother. And in, in the song, she, there's a reference to someone called Fitzy, who was her close friend, Anna Fitzsimons. So we're going to sing the song now. It's an absolute pleasure to be with Crash Ensemble. And I want to thank Barry O'Halpin for <coughs> arranging it. So this is Kathleen McKenna. My name is Kathleen McKenna One of seven children Daughter of a merchant draper Cut from proud green cloth And it's off I took to Dublin For a secret post at the bulletin as clandestine typist They put my skills to the test Three pairs of critical eyes Fixed on my fingers As they danced unerringly Over the keys of my typewriter my name is Kathleen McKenna The eldest of seven children 
daughter of a munitions factory worker with a fierce heart of a fighter of a fighter I was frank and ingenious guided by self-preservation resolute never to fail those who put their faith in me I've never held a carabine to fire it off in fury but I load the barrel with ink of our beloved printing machine Gerald, his own right hand, and I guard my godchild with jealous affection, a fleet of messenger boys at my command. spent in Molesworth Street with no one to light the fire. The caretaker was a stranger and so could not be trusted. So Fitzy and I, the two of us, were obliged to line our stockings with blotting paper to keep ourselves warm and dry with searchlights on the windows and prowlers in the neighborhood I was advised to hop while the hopping was good No pity for them for trying To hound us from our den For never once did we falter To pin our words on a wing And keep the flag flying past 20 months we were hunted and we were harried but I carry them in my heart as the best I've ever lived and I am elated to now realize 
I too had a place in the serried ranks of our soldiers. My name is Kathleen McKenna. With ink on my fingers, I linger on the threshold and wave goodbye to my godchild. Good evening, people. It's really, really wonderful and educational to be here this evening. I'm just going to move this a little. My name is Lisa O'Neill. This is Brian Leach. Um, I'll keep this introduction short, but I feel I really want to give a small one. Um, I, I've never enjoyed researching anybody as much as I have enjoyed research, researching Arthur Griffiths. He, he was many things, I guess, and he did many things. But my main focus in my song, finally, after three months of, of, of trying to understand and live um, with his story, Arthur Griffiths wrote ballads and collected ballads and wrote about ballads. And so the first P 
piece that you hear me doing this evening, which is spoken word, is written by Arthur Griffith himself and was published in his newspaper, The United Irishman, in 1904. And it's his take on what the ballad means to the people from baby up until old age, until it's nearly over. And I think that he had a great understanding of human beings and their psychology and you know what is how powerful a song is to us in our lifetime and how powerful the ballad is how it can change us and how we need it at different points in our life to remember things and it lives after us so right on, up until i speak the word nation they are arthur griffith's words and then after that we take it away into my reaction my song and i call this salutations Ballad history is welcome to childhood for its rhymes, its higher colouring, and its aptness to memory. As we grow into boyhood and girlhood, the violent passions, the vague hopes, the romantic sorrow of patriot ballads are in tune with our fitful and luxuriant feelings. In adulthood, we prize the dense narrative, the grave firmness, the critical and political way of ballads. And in old age, they are doubly dear the companions and reminders of our life, the toys and teachers of our children and grandchildren, every generation finds its account in them. They pass from mouth to mouth like salutations. They pass from mouth to mouth like salutations. Even the minds which lose their words are under their influence, as one can recall the starry heavens as one can recall the starry heavens who cannot revive the form of a single constellation as one can recall the starry heavens who cannot revive the form of the Irish nation they pass from mount to mount said he such salutations set us free they stars to eyes who scan the sky to compose constellations art the griffith composition vain and give us inspiration we'll never all see eye to eye or meet on old occasion but conversation time to time can transform generations we'll never all meet of one mind appreciate one station december 6th in 21 this man built a foundation me he Fractors 
First time, a wonderful songwriter, and it's her first time to play the concert hall. And this is Maya Sophia. Thank you. So I chose to write a song about um, Countess Markovich um, because, I, I mean, she's just an incredible character. And um, the text that the lyrics are taken from were, well, there's two main texts, mostly the letters she wrote from prison to her sister, Eva Gore Booth, who is also an incredible revolutionary and then the speech that she made with, in which she was virulently anti-treaty because she was essentially a socialist and she felt that accepting the terms of the treaty as it was offered um, was just a repetition of more of the same inequality. So she was very ardently against that. And I'm very honored to be joined by the amazing Maeve McKenna on harp who we just discovered is related to Kathleen McKenna who was the subject of Adrian Crowley's amazing song so that's extra special <laughs> um, and yeah it's um it's a real privilege to be here so thank you so much <laughs> I've lost 
Forgive me. 